Hello and welcome to the Westminster Confession Online. This lecture will be moving onward from justification and adoption to look at sanctification, faith, and repentance. As we move onward, we must remember that justification has established our pardon before God and the righteousness that we have through Christ. Sanctification, as we move forward, is the continued work of God to conform us to the image of his Son by the Holy Spirit. Justification declares us righteous and enters us into a perfect state before the Father, while sanctification is an ongoing work by the grace of God according to the power of Christ and the Spirit. Then we'll be moving on to faith and repentance, which are both continually gifts of God as a result of regeneration. Faith, as we have seen, is the intermediate cause of justification. It is that which brings us into relationship with Christ, resting and receiving him alone for our justification. It is therefore how we move into this relationship with God that he has established objectively through the power of the cross. Repentance, on the other hand, is flowing out of a revived heart produced by regeneration and is a connection to faith itself. And these two ideas, faith and regeneration, need to be conceived of in two ways, as both initial and continual. In some ways, faith and regeneration are binary. You have faith or you do not. You have repented of your sins or you have not. However, unlike justification and adoption, which are stable states in which we've been brought into a new status before God the Father, faith and repentance are ongoing works in our hearts. We have come into this relationship, we have faith, and we have repented, but we will continue to operate on faith and continue to repent. And therefore, in this initial aspect of faith and repentance, we see it connected with union with Christ and justification and effectual calling. However, as we look at the ongoing aspects of faith and repentance, that is more connected to the understanding of sanctification. Hopefully, we see all these connections as we go through the lecture today. In this, we'll be breaking this down according to each chapter, beginning with sanctification, giving its definition in section 1 of chapter 13, moving on to this discussion of progressive sanctification. What does it mean that we're continually sanctified by God's power through the Spirit and Christ? And then the continued struggle with sin. The confession is very clear about understanding the lived experience of the believer before God. We'll then move on to saving faith, looking at its source, what it entails, and the experience of faith as well. Remember, the assembly is made up of not just theologians, but all these men were pastors, and wanted to make sure that faith was understood in this right way to avoid any misunderstanding. We'll then look at the doctrine of repentance unto life why it needs to be preached, and we'll talk about why they begin this chapter with the preaching of repentance, its definition, and then how this flows out in both private and public confession. Let's begin by defining sanctification. And sanctification asks this fundamental question. How can the justified sinner live rightly before the holy God who saves? Now, notice in the framing of this, it's on the basis of justification already. We are justified sinners, and we are now in this new relationship with the holy God. Our sins are pardoned, and we have been declared righteous. But what does it mean to continue to live before him? Salvation is not merely an event in the past, but it's an ongoing reality in our lives. We are not being saved, but we have been saved. What does it mean for the saved sinner to live rightly before the holy God? How do we continue to grow in our faith and our understanding? In this, because of sanctification, which in its basic definition is to be set apart, to be declared holy, to be made holy, all of these are kind of connected, to sanctify his people by the blood of Christ, God is making them holy before him. Again, it is essential that we understand that we are not made right with God because we are made holy. That would be the infused righteousness idea of the Roman Catholic Church. No, rather, God first justifies the sinner, clearing them in the court of God's power, such that 
they are forgiven of their sins and declared righteous. But upon this, they are then sanctified and made holy by God's grace. And this is a result of justification and adoption. If we flip the relationship between sanctification and justification, we are back to works righteousness. Sanctification comes after justification. We are declared righteous, and then we are made holy. And this is continually done through our union with Christ, who stands as our high priest, pleading his sacrifice before the eternal throne of God. And therefore, sanctification is in no way a discussion of how to earn salvation or how to keep salvation. It is a discussion of how do we live out our justified state in relationship to Jesus Christ, the holy God who has called us and led us, and by the power of the Spirit who has remodeled us, regenerated us, and led us forward. This is very important. We need to remember that holy living or a holy life is in no way a call to legalism. One does not earn anything before God with a holy life. One's actions and good works and sanctified mind and heart are not the cause of justification or our relationship with God. They always flow out of this established covenantal relationship with God the Father. And because of this, especially in the modern evangelical and even some parts of the Reformed Church, we need to be very clear on this. To preach holiness, to call for holy living and good works, is not legalism, as long as it is properly defined within this relationship to the ascended Christ, union with him, and justification. There are corners of the church that will say any call to holiness is just moving back to works righteousness. This is not the case. That is merely a folk antinomianism that must be rejected. So let's begin with this definition as it's set forward in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, saying what is sanctification? Sanctification is a work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. We see several elements here that will be fleshed out in the first section of the confession itself. Notice that this is by God's grace, and it is a work. A distinction needs to be made here. So if you look at the Westminster Catechism on adoption and justification, you will see that they are acts of God, while sanctification is a work of God. What that's getting at is because justification and adoption are definitive events in that one is moved from a state of unrighteousness to righteousness, from alienation from God to being his son or daughter. Sanctification is an ongoing work. While it is based on this state change from sinner to justified, God continues to work in our lives so that we can die unto sin and live unto righteousness. These are the ideas of mortification, putting to death the sin that is in us, and vivification, enlivening our hearts to follow God out of joy and peace. So this is the doctrine of sanctification which will be unfolding. Before we do this, we need to make sure that we're properly distinguishing justification and sanctification. I've already mentioned this several times, but this is extremely important. If we do not rightly relate our justified status before God and our sanctification, we can easily fall into works righteousness or we can fall into some sort of idea of antinomianism. So this rejects both. And the Westminster Larger Catechism gets at this quite clearly in question 77. It asks this, wherein do justification and sanctification differ? Although sanctification be inseparably joined with justification, yet they differ. And then it goes on to give several ways in which they differ. First, justification is based on the imputed righteousness of Christ. It is an alien event. We are declared righteous before God, not for anything in us, but for everything in Christ. And therefore, Christ's righteousness makes us holy. In sanctification, this is not an alien event. This is an event that takes place within us. It is by the Spirit infusing grace in us and enabling us to exercise out of that grace. So justification is purely forensic. It is outside of us. By union with Christ, we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Sanctification is a work within us. As we're united to Christ, who is holy, the Spirit who enlivens our hearts and our minds will then make us holy and give us the ability to exercise therein. In justification, we are holy and utterly passive. There is nothing we can ever do. We are dead in our sins. 
However, in sanctification, we continue to work along with God. Now, don't think of this as cooperation, or God does his part and I do my part. No, rather, we are made alive and we live in this. Think back to the section on free will. We are now able not to sin, and that is done by the grace of God. And so in sanctification, we have an active part along with the Spirit and Christ, but not in such a way that we are ever given merit by it. If you remember Paul's statement that Christ is the one who works in me. It is not I, but Christ in me. That is the element of sanctification. But there still is the act of the will here, unlike in justification. So we have this distinction. In justification, righteousness is imputed to the sinner. In sanctification, grace is infused in our hearts so that we might now live. In justification, our sins are pardoned. It's a legal element. In sanctification, they are subdued within us. Therefore, it is this act that breaks the power of sin in our hearts and allows us to live for God. They also have a difference in their effect on the sinner. So justification is equally free to all who believe from the avenging wrath of God. So by justification, we are declared innocent and therefore will not be held to any account. God's wrath is taken by Christ. His punishment is taken by Christ. However, sanctification is not so. It is not equal in all. And this is part of that idea that it is a work. Some are more sanctified than others. It is an ongoing process by which the spirit works in our hearts to put to death our sin and to enliven our hearts. And so there can be different degrees of sanctification within the church. Think of this in terms of mature and immature believers. Those who have been in the faith longer, who have exercised this will more, are in some sense more sanctified. Now, this does not mean they have a different status before God, but it is the kind of place they are on their journey with God. Additionally, justification is perfect in time. Because we are justified, it is a state change from dead in our sins to alive and forgiven in Christ. It has no degrees. One is justified or is not justified. And we are perfectly justified in this life. Justification is the firm foundation on which all of our salvation rests, the complete and utter grace of God. Sanctification, on the other hand, being based on justification, is not perfect in this life, but it is a process of growth. This distinction between justification as a state and sanctification as a process is essential for us to understand the outworkings of the Christian life. All of this, as sanctification, is rightly related to justification. We need to bring it into this broader idea here. For all the Christian life is placed away from striving and good works into a proper context of a loving obedience to our Father, rather than any attempt to nullify this promise of salvation by grace. As we think about sanctification, it must always be put within the broader context of the doctrines of predestination and election, God's effectual calling, and justification. They can in no way be separated in such a way that sanctification becomes a ground for our acceptance by God or in any way takes away from salvation by grace alone through faith alone. So sanctification comes after this as part of our ongoing relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So having clearly set up the distinction between sanctification and justification, let's go deeper into the definition of sanctification proper. I want to begin here by reading section 1 of chapter 13 and then we'll break it down according to its different elements. This is what the confession says. They, who are once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified really and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified. And they, more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces, to the practice of true holiness, without which no man shall see God. So we see here that this is based on the effectual calling and regeneration, both of which are connected to our union with Christ, that we are fundamentally changed with a new heart and a new spirit within us. And we are really and personally sanctified. Regeneration is not just the beginning of salvation. It is the beginning of an entire process of being made holy by Christ our Lord. And we are really made holy and we are personally made holy. 
the body of Christ is in some sense sanctified. The church is certainly called holy, but it is also given to each individual to live out a new life with Christ our Lord. Now let's look at the elements then of sanctification. First and foremost, we must always remember that the source of all these acts are God's free grace. Christ has died for us by grace. The Father has united us with Christ by grace. The Spirit dwells in us by grace. This is all based on God's eternal election and nothing within us. Recall this time and time again. We are saved not because of God's uh, looking at us and seeing something worthwhile here, but by his power, he makes us his own. This is the source of both justification and sanctification, and we should never forget this. Additionally, we can see that this idea of God's grace has been woven through the confession so far in this view of sanctification by connecting this idea to God's decree and to Christ as the mediator. This is to confirm always that salvation comes through the grace of God. We can look back to section 3.6 in the decrees that says that those who are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his spirit working in due season are justified, adopted, and sanctified and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. So this process of sanctification is grounded in the eternal decree of God. Those whom Christ has been given will not only be justified, but also will be sanctified. This is expressed again in section 8.1 on Christ the mediator, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. So sanctification is based on God's promise, his elective grace, the covenant made with Christ and Christ as the mediator. The second we begin to separate sanctification from this broader concept of doctrine is where it will go awry. So we must be firm on this. Salvation and sanctification come only from God's grace. Now, what is the meritorious cause of the sanctification in us? Why is it that we are made holy? It is nothing other than the virtues of Christ's death and resurrection given to us by union with Christ. Every time the confession invokes effectual calling, recall that it connects that to union with Christ, that as we are effectually called, we are united with Christ and all of his benefits, such that by this union, the virtue and benefits of Christ's death and resurrection now are ours and are being made ours at the same time. So how is it that we are made righteous before God? By Christ's death imputed to us. How is it that we're continually made holy by God? By the virtues of Christ's death and resurrection infused in us by the Spirit through union with Christ. We see this in the means. How is it that we come to be sanctified? By Christ's word and spirit dwelling within us. This is Christ as the eternal word of creation who is continually united with us and and shapes us and leads us, as well as the inscripturated word that continually works in our hearts to follow Christ, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, the spirit of holiness and truth. We are sanctified not by ourselves, but by the power of the spirit and the word working in us. What are the results? Sanctification first destroys the dominion of sin entirely. When we were dead in our sins and trespasses, we were under the power of sin, the power of the evil one, the power of the world. And by justification and sanctification, those powers are completely broken. We are no longer slaves to sin, as Paul says, but now we are slaves of righteousness, renewed by the power of Christ and the Spirit. So there's a definitive aspect here. The power of sin has been broken. We are freed. We have been ransomed. We are now free to live in the Spirit of God. And where the Spirit of God is, there is true freedom. So sanctification is this freedom from sin. It also, therefore, has a twofold aspect that we've hit on before. Mortification and the weakening of sin, putting to death that part in us that we might die unto sin, and vivification by all the saving graces God has given to us that we, we might live unto righteousness. And therefore, sanctification has several elements. The definitive, we are out of the domain of sin into the domain of Christ. We are continually mortifying our flesh and being vivified. So these actions, the mortification of sin and the vivification of grace come from the Spirit, and there is a corresponding activity in ourselves. As the Spirit mortifies our sins, so do we. As the Spirit vivifies our hearts to choose God and to live for Him, so do we, by cultivating the graces given to us. And that is part of the Christian life. And this is in our reception, that we are seeking to practice true holiness. 
by our own mortification and vivification. God did not save us merely from the results of sin. He saved us so that we might live holy and righteous lives before him, that we might practice true holiness because our God is holy. This is, once again, not the earning of salvation, but learning to become the children of the holy God, learning to have our lives filled and following in the way of Christ, having the Spirit who is holiness himself dwelling within us. Sanctification in the practice of true holiness is nothing else than attempting to be whom God has made us to be in Christ. So, setting forth this element, we see the defining nature of sanctification. It is by grace from beginning to end, it is done by the Holy Spirit, and it is that which empowers us to live unto righteousness and die unto sin. Let's see how the confession breaks this down. So, sanctification is not merely a definitive state of being connected to Christ and therefore having his righteousness within us, but there is a continual struggle with sin. As the confession says, a continual and irreconcilable war with sin. This sanctification is throughout, in the whole man yet imperfect in this life, there abiding still some remnant of corruption in every part. Whence arises a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a couple things to note here. First, as sin is total, remember total depravity, all of our parts, our intellect, our mind, our will, our affections have been corrupted by sin. So sanctification is total in that same sense. It is a reformation of our mind. We are renewed in our minds. It is a reformation of our heart and our emotions and our will. We are now living in a new way. So just as sin has touched every part of human life, so sanctification renews every part. Here, this is pushing against any concept of either antinomianism and perfectionism or neonomianism. What does this mean? So in many antinomian and perfectionist traditions, once one is united with Christ, they can achieve a state of perfection in which sin is no longer seen in the individual by God the Father or to a state where they do not sin at all. For instance, several in the holiness tradition will have a view of perfectionism in which at some point one receives a second blessing by the Spirit such that they will sin no more. The divines are much more circumspect about this, arguing that throughout our entire lives we will continually fight with sin, and this fight will never be over in our lives. Nor is it, according to the antinomians, that sin is no longer a problem because we have been freed from the power of the law. So this rejects all of that. Additionally, this rejects any concept of legalism, thinking that after we are saved, we can have any meritorious element before God. Even our best works are still tainted by sin. So in this, we recognize this continual and irreconcilable war between sin and the spirit within us. This brings us to a distinction that is often made at this point between definitive sanctification and progressive sanctification. I think this is helpful. Definitive sanctification has been defined by John Murray as there is a once for all definitive and irreversible breach with the realm in which sin reigns and unto death. So there is this fundamental breach. We see this in the confession with the dominion of sin is wholly destroyed in us. We are no longer in sin, but in Christ. The larger catechism, question 75, fleshes this out, saying that the Spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them renewed in their whole man after the image of God. So we are now renewed. We are now wholly in union with Christ. We are no longer under the power of sin. This is definitive sanctification. It is not inappropriate to call us saints or holy ones, as Paul does continually. We are holy because of Christ. We are holy before the Father. This is the definitive sanctification. But this is not all. There is also the ongoing process or progressive sanctification. This ongoing work of the Spirit to conform us more and more to the image of Jesus Christ, to aid us in this continual war, to give us the victory. We will always have sin in us. This is a very clear-eyed view of the Christian life. This is reflected perhaps most poignantly in Romans 7, where Paul discusses how he cannot do what he wills to do, the struggle with sin that continually is in us. And therefore, by the use of the means of grace, the Word and the Spirit, we can grow and reject the sin that is in us, that we can die to sin and live 
unto righteousness. Now, this brings us to another question. If we understand sanctification as definitive, you are declared holy by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our union with him, and you are made holy by the progressive work of the Holy Spirit, conforming us more and more in heart, mind, will, and soul, and every part to the image of Jesus Christ, the utter holy one. We do need to ask a question in relationship of this doctrine to Luther especially. Within evangelicalism and Protestantism more broadly, Luther's idea of semel justus et peccator is the main way of thinking about this. That is, at once just and a sinner. This is an idea that the Reformed would agree with in one sense, but not in another. And I think this is the appropriate place to discuss this. For Luther, you remain a sinner and a saint at all times. And they have in some ways equal prominence, as this war between the flesh and the spirit will be continual and perhaps unreconcilable in this life. And this, on this idea, the reform would clearly agree. We are those who still sin. However, if you notice the language here, we are just and a sinner. One of those is an adjective. The other is a, state, a status term. And the Reformed look at this slightly differently. We are instead saints who sin. We, our definitive status is no longer that of sinner. You'll see in Paul that he never calls believers in Christ sinners any longer. We are now saints, holy ones of God, justified and made righteous before him and being united to Christ. And as saints, we still sin. Notice here that the discord is between our actual status as the holy ones and the fact that we continue to sin. That is a abomination. That is the tension that must be rejected. For Luther, because he focuses on sin and often does downplay sanctification, his focus is much more on the sinful state of humanity that does not change and the oddness of the justice that God has given us. Now, that's an appropriate perspective, but when we come to sanctification, we need to understand our pure identity is those who have been connected with Christ, who have the Holy Spirit, and who live out of it. Sin is a foreign invader that we must fight and reject continually. We shall never make peace with it. And while Luther does not intend that, some who have followed him have. For instance, Gerard Ford, who is often considered a radical Lutheran or in the radical Lutheranism tradition in the ELCA, has argued that sanctification is only getting used to our justification. And so there is no continual process by which God makes us holy. We are merely justified, and sanctification for Ford is merely coming to recognize and understand that status more. The Reformed reject this, and as do many other conservative Lutherans. No, we are saints who now sin. And that sin is something true and it will never be erased in our life, but we must battle against it continually by grace through faith, not as a way of earning anything before God. But we cannot make peace with sin, even for a moment. And the confession fleshes this out even more as it looks at the struggle with sin in section three, saying that to which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, Yet, through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome, and so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sanctification is not a straightforward process throughout our lives, but experiences many victories and also defeats as sin continues to dwell in the believer. We are seeking to live rightly before God, and this war will continually go onward. However, there is great comfort here, knowing that as we struggle with sin and temptation, Christ is with us, the Spirit of Christ dwells in us, and the regenerate part will prevail, that there will be victory over sin. Christ will supply his strength, and the Spirit will give us glory and joy through the process. This is the pastoral side of the Westminster Confession coming out recognizing those who are working with people who are struggling in sin, that sometimes sin seems so strong, but Christ will triumph over it. So we rely on these graces as we struggle with sin, nothing in ourselves, but in the Spirit's power and Christ's finished work on the cross. This is fleshed out a little bit more in the larger catechism, question 79, where it asks, what are we supposed to do? Can we fall away? from this, when we're struggling with sin, when it seems so powerful, 
Does that mean God has abandoned us? Does that mean that we've been rejected? It says no. True believers, by reason of the unchangeable love of God and his decree and covenant to give them preservation, their inseparable union with Christ, his continual intercession for them, and the spirit and seed of God abiding in them, can neither totally nor finally be taken away from the state of grace, but are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So even in the midst of struggles, we have faith not in ourselves, but in God's power. We look to his decree of election that is sure and unshakable. We look to our union with Christ and the fact that as he is ascended, he continually intercedes for us. We look to the spirit operating in us and abiding with us and giving us strength and joy. We can never fall away because we are held by the power of God. As we struggle with sin along this road of sanctification, we look in faith to that salvation. We trust not in our own power or our merit, but in Christ and his finished work. So as we look at this, I think this is a very helpful pastoral word that as we help those who are struggling with sin, we point them not to themselves, but to Christ. We point them not to their sin, but to God's holiness and love and mercy. We point them not to their own will, but the power of the Spirit working in them. And therefore, we pray for those who are struggling. We wait expectantly that God will give victory. And therefore, we continue to grow in perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is in some ways the mantra of those who have been saved. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Not to earn anything, as I've said repeatedly, but to live as God has made us to be his sons and daughters, befitting his holy and righteous name. Again, not on our own, but by the power of the Spirit and our union with Christ. I should make one more note here. In this section, there has been some critique of the confession for its statement, the regenerate part. Uh, and those who have critiqued this are quite wide and varied. For instance, Karl Barth makes this point, as does John Murray, arguing that this would indicate some sort of partial regeneration in the believer. I think this is largely a misunderstanding here of the confession statement. Rather, they are saying that as all of us, all parts of us have been regenerate, as they said before, in our heart, mind, will, and soul, that as we struggle between the flesh and the spirit, the spiritual part, the new man, if you will, will triumph over sin. This is not a statement of partial regeneration, but merely a statement that the new man will triumph over the old. Although I do understand this is a bit infelicitous in how they stated this. But as we live out of our union with Christ, as we are continually made holy and rely on him, we can seek him. We can seek holiness because we know who God is, the Holy One. As we do this, what are the ways in which we pursue holiness? This brings us to the one-two of the Christian life, both faith and and repentance. And this is where the confession continues onward. I want us to recall the order in which the confession is setting out salvation here. It is beginning with the work of God in justification, adoption, and sanctification. And then it moves to our reception and response in faith and repentance. Now, this does not mean, as I said before, that faith and repentance are conceived of as after sanctification. This would make no sense, considering sanctification, as the divines have put it, is a lifelong process. No, they want to front God's activity, God's powerful work, and only then look at the human response and reception of faith and repentance. So keep this all in mind. We're going to look at these in turn. Faith in Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. So again, we begin here with grace. While repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God, with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. Faith and repentance, as I noted earlier, should be conceived of both initially and continually. We come to have faith in Christ and repent because of effectual calling. Both of these are not of ourselves, but are a saving grace by which God has operated within us. The Christian life pursuing sanctification is done in faith with continual repentance going forward. Now, how should these two be related? 
In many ways, faith must come first because to repent fully, we must come to know God and then see our sin in a new light. One who is dead in sin cannot repent because sin is merely their natural state. But once one comes to have faith in Jesus Christ as he is offered in the gospel, we see our sin in a new light and we can repent thereof. However, we should not be concerned necessarily with their relationship in time. Faith can precede repentance by quite some time. And so as we think about that in terms of the Ordo Salutis, we should have a very complex and nuanced understanding. So how are we to see these related? Well, Gadiker at the assembly had a rather good way of putting this. He said that repentance and faith are comparable to thunder and lightning. Although occurring together in time, we apprehend them separately. I think that's a very helpful way to think of it. Faith is the lightning that we see occur, and repentance can come later on. But they are actually one event, and that event is effectual calling and regeneration. All true faith is a penitent faith, trusting in who God is, and all true repentance is based on faith. So these are, in some ways, two sides of the same coin, although we should think of them uh, in their fullness so that we can understand their complexities. Where does faith come from? The divines continue that the grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls, is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also, and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer, it is increased and strengthened. So here we see that distinction. Initial faith with is ordinarily produced by the Word of God and the strengthening of faith. Let's break this down a bit. The source of all faith is, once again, God's grace, which faith they have not of themselves, it is a gift of God, as they say in this section on justification, echoing Paul in Ephesians 2. Faith itself, this habit of trusting God, this implanted life that looks not to ourselves but to our eternal God, is a gift, is a grace, is not something from within us, it is not an act of our will, but it is the power of the Spirit of Christ working in us. So all of this is grace from beginning to end. Its cause then is that regeneration of the heart by the Holy Spirit as we're turned from sin to God. In this, we have a great joy of living out our lives before the Father. The object of faith is a little, a little more complicated here. Generally, we talk about having faith in Christ, which is certainly appropriate. But through having faith in Christ, we also have faith in the Father and the Spirit. So the object of faith is best defined as the triune God revealed in Jesus Christ. To have faith in Christ is to also have faith in the Father who sent him and the Spirit who works in our hearts. So while Christ is in some ways the foundation of our faith, this overflows into faith into the entire work of the triune God. And so we should not be confused about this. We have faith in the Father, Son, and Spirit, and we have faith in Christ. And these are not in any way opposed to one another. But Christ is the means by which our faith in the entire triune work comes to fruition in our hearts, as he is the revelation of God himself. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so it's appropriate to say we trust in Christ and imply by that the trust in the Father and the Spirit as well. So by trusting in Christ and living this out, we ordinarily receive this by the word preached or the word written. Notice though they make this the ordinary means. God is able by his own power to create faith in other ways, although he generally does not do so. This would include um, dreams, for instance, or some other way of coming to God. But the word is going to still be active. God will not ever go against the word in doing this, but the spirit will create faith in the person. One way to break down faith a little bit that I think is helpful comes from John Murray as well. He breaks down faith in terms of knowledge, conviction, and trust. So to have faith, we first must know God. You can't trust someone that you do not know. By regeneration and the power of the word, we come to know who God is in Jesus Christ. We are then convicted that he is true, that he is one to be trusted, that he is merciful. And so by faith, it is that act of receiving and resting upon Christ alone for our salvation. And this is normally done through the means of grace, and therefore preaching is essential here. If someone wants to come to faith, they need to sit under the word, to hear it preached, to have a heart expectant to hear from the Father. 
and if we want to grow in faith, not just the initial from unbelief to belief, but to grow in faith, to have a firmer faith after the transfiguration, as the Father says to Christ, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, indicates to us that we can have faith, but that faith can be strengthened. And therefore, how do we strengthen our faith? By the study of the word and preaching, by the sacraments, and by prayer. God has given us means to strengthen our faith, to trust in him more, to have this work in us, to have more knowledge of him, who he truly is, to have our convictions more firmly established, and to see throughout all redemptive history how he has been trustworthy and true. This steadfast love has truly prevailed throughout the ages. Therefore, saving faith comes by the work of God alone, based on his grace and the work of the Spirit of Christ in us, that we might believe unto Christ and the entire triune God and continue to walk in this way. So we see this source of faith. Now let's look at what faith entails. I've actually reversed the order of section two here because I want to begin with the principal object of faith and then, then only after establish the obedience that flows out of this. As the confession says, but the principal act of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by the virtue of the covenant of grace. The principal act of faith, therefore, is passive, receiving, resting, accepting. Christ acts and we trust. Christ acts and we relinquish our ability and our control. This connects us back to chapter 11, where faith is the instrument, the medium of justification, not its source, but how we connect. As Christ has been offered to us, we accept him. As Christ is our righteousness, we rest on him alone and nothing of ourselves, not just for justification, but for sanctification as well, trusting in Christ, trusting on his merit, his power, his glory, and his grace. And therefore, the continual movement of faith is turning from ourselves to Jesus Christ and his mercy. If faith begins to look on ourselves or on our work or anything else, it will shift into idolatry. Only Christ and the Father and the Spirit are worthy of our devotion utterly, our trust, our unreserved allegiance, resting and receiving them alone. As one of the Puritans slightly after the assembly, George Swinnock put it, first, faith must look out for Christ. Secondly, faith must look up to Christ for grace. Thirdly, faith must take Christ down or receive him and grace. So every step of faith, which aren't really steps, but they're ways of thinking here, look to Christ who is our salvation. Look to Christ who is the one who gives us grace. Look to Christ and receive him alone and take him down into our hearts that we might walk and live for him. Notice also in this section that faith is connected with the covenant, God's covenant faithfulness throughout redemptive history for all of this. So faith rests on Christ alone, but not merely this. As we have faith in Christ, we are also directed to have faith in his word. And this is how section two begins. By this faith, a Christian believes to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word. For the authority of God himself speaking therein. Therefore, to trust Christ is to trust his word, as he is the eternal word of the Father, who has spoken scripture to us. And this goes against any sort of idea that we can have faith in Christ as our Savior and not trust everything he says. Coming to Christ as our Lord and our Savior is not a piecemeal affair. To trust in Christ, to rest and receive him alone for our salvation, is also to trust all of his words. Our faith in God cannot be divvied up. Well, I trust him for this, but not for this. And therefore, our belief in scripture, going all the way back to the first chapter of the confession, is because God himself speaks, and we trust his word. We do not give in to any other attempts to tell us how the world is. We trust our creator, our Lord, and our God. Therefore, belief in Scripture is properly a result in an act of faith, as a sure disposition to trust God at His Word. The authority of His Word is therefore based on faith that we receive the illumination of the Spirit, and in so doing, we obey in all ways. And that's how this continues. Trusting God's Word means that we act differently upon that which each particular passage thereof contains. Now, this is a very helpful point here. To have faith in Christ is also to walk in trust of his word. 
but to approach it according to the different aspects. As it says, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. This is a very sophisticated understanding of Scripture. Scripture speaks in multiple ways. We can talk about it as having different speech acts. It commands, and therefore we must obey. It warns, therefore we must take heed. It promises, therefore we must believe. In all of this, we take Scripture for what it is, and the act of faith is to respond appropriately to each part. This means that we must meditate on the Word to grow in our faith. What are the commands that we are called to fulfill? How can we obey them more fully in the power of the Spirit? What are the threatenings? What are the warnings that God gives us? Do we truly tremble before them? Do we have the appropriate response here? So in this, we also see that faith is not merely an intellectual act. It is that, but it is not merely that. It is also the appropriate response, and it changed different aspects of us. We are to lean on the Word itself. So we are to know new things by faith, trusting in His Word, we are to act differently by obedience, and we are to have a different effectual response as well, to tremble at the warnings and to embrace and love the promises. So faith is all-encompassing. As we trust in Christ and the Father and the Spirit through Him, we trust His Word. Every aspect of our lives is therefore in obedience to His saving power. And this is really just an outworking of what it says in 1-2, that all scripture which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. Therefore, scripture is our rule of faith, what we believe and how we follow unto Jesus. Also, as in the section on sanctification, the divines end this with a discussion of the experience of faith. Just as sanctification is a continual war with sin in us, faith is not perfect in this life. As they say, this faith is different in degree, weak or strong, may be often and many times assailed and weakened, but gets the victory growing up in many to the attainment of full assurance through Christ, who is both the author and finisher of our faith. This is a helpful understanding. If someone thinks of a certain experience of faith as utterly normative, and if they say, well, my faith is weak and therefore I must not be saved, that's very damaging. We see throughout Scripture that even the apostles had weak faiths at times, and we can grow in faith. This is so that we can be careful to make sure that we are calling people to have faith in Christ and not faith in their faith. By this, we don't look inward for our assurance. We don't look inward to how strong is my belief. We look outward to how strong is my God and how worthy is the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this connection to assurance as we get to chapter 18. In this whole section on faith, we need to note that it is Christ-centered from beginning to end. Christ is the beginning and end of our faith. He is the source of it, both meritoriously and by the Spirit of Christ working in us. He is the end of our faith as our object. He is the perfecter of our faith, as it says in Hebrews. He is the foundation of our faith, the one who bought it for us at the cross, who sent the Spirit to implant it in our hearts. He's the proper object of it and the one who strengthens it and preserves it. From the beginning to end, our faith is in Jesus Christ, not our self, not our works, not our emotions, not our feelings. We trust in Christ. And as we trust in Christ, we trust his word. And as we trust in Christ, we trust in the Father who sent him. And as we trust in Christ, we trust the spirit that is in us. From beginning to end, the Christian life is one of faith. Knowing who Christ is, being convicted that he is who he says he is, that he died and rose from the dead, and trusting him with all of our lives, having no reservations full and complete commitment to the Lord. As John Flavel puts it, Christ is the life of faith. From beginning to end, from morning till night, Jesus Christ is the source of our life, the source of our faith, and its continual surety until the end. We've established now what it means to walk in sanctification. Part of that is the walking in faith, trusting in Jesus, trusting in his power and mercy. Now, this has a correspondence. To trust in Christ's death, must mean to acknowledge the sin for which he died. And this brings us then to repentance unto life. Now, as we looked at with the Gattaker quote, these two go together as two sides of the same coin. Although as thunder and lightning, they could be distinguished in time if that is necessary. Divines begin in what might seem like an odd place. Rather than beginning as they have in many other sections with a definition of 
repentance. They begin with the call to preach repentance, saying, Repentance unto life is an evangelical grace. The doctrine whereof is to be preached by every minister of the gospel, as well as that of faith in Christ. Now, why is it that they begin here? I think what they're doing is, before they get to the definition, they want to be clear that preaching repentance is necessary. That one should not see repentance as some sort of ancillary to faith or some shameful thing to be hidden away. We are called to preach repentance always. And this is a rebuke to the antinomians, who would argue that one should only preach the gospel of Christ's death, but not call for continual repentance, because that would be a return to the law and moral commands. And if you recall, in this, uh, the antinomian said, there is no sense in which God sees our sin, and therefore calls to repentance from the pulpit, according to the antinomians, were merely legalism. This must be utterly, utterly rejected. We are called to preach the grace of Christ, and as a result of that grace, for the sinner to repent. This is said over and over throughout Scripture. We see this, for instance, in Luke 24, 47, and that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Once again, at the end of the book of Acts, Acts 20, 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. We preach the gospel and we preach repentance. They go together. And this should be a warning in our own day, when many are much more comfortable preaching the glories of God's forgiveness in Christ without calling for repentance, either of new Christians or the Christians who are in the pews. This is not appropriate. Repentance is the lifeblood of the Christian life. As we come to know God more and more, we see our sin more and more, and we must reject it and continue to work through this irreconcilable war between sin and the Spirit working in us. So preaching of repentance must be a firm part of the Christian life. The next several sections from section 2 to 4 of chapter 15 define repentance. And what they're doing here is working off the original Greek term metanoia, repentance being a turning or a changing of mind, turning from sin to God, and therefore repentance necessarily has these two parts, a new knowledge of God and a new knowledge of sin, both of which are produced by faith. Recall, as this is an evangelical grace, a grace coming from the gospel, that it is connected to effectual calling, which produces that new heart in us. And so metanoia, turning from one thing to another thing, is the essence of repentance. By this faith in which we come to know Jesus Christ, we come to see our sin for what it really is. As the confession says, out of the sight and sense not only of the dangers, but also the filthiness and odiousness of our sin. As we come to see God's holiness, his perfect perfection, we see that we are sinful. We see that sin is actually that bad. As we see the cross and we see what it took for our sins to be paid for, we can look at it anew. As we are away from God, sin seems like no big deal. But as we come to know God, his pure holiness, we can see the utter shabbiness of our sin. Calvin talks about this in terms of the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. As we come to reflect on God's holiness, even our best works seem shabby and worthless compared to his surpassing light and beauty. And so the beginning of repentance is seeing sin, and that comes with seeing God. Uh, these are two halves of the same coin once again. As we see our sin for the affront it is to God, we can see him more and more. In light of that, that horrible sin, God is still merciful. And we see that sin is contrary to his holy nature and the righteous law of God, and upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ to such as are penitent. So as we see our sin, we see God, and as we see God, we see our sin. We see that he is holy. He has given a righteous law. And as we reflect on the law, we see how we have failed to meet it time and time again. And as so doing, we can repent of that failure, trusting on the mercy in Christ. So repentance comes with a new knowledge of sin and a new knowledge of God. And this calls out of us a full repentance, trusting in Christ's grace alone. So it grieves for and hates his sin and to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. 
as we think of repentance, it has both an intellectual, a effectual, and a volitional part. It is an act of our intellect, our will, and our emotions. As we come to see sin for what it is, we recoil at its horridness, as it, at its filthiness, and we hate it, and we are grieved that we've ever done it. So repentance should have an emotional component, but it will be connected to an intellect, seeing once again what sin is and who God is. And it has an endeavor of the will. We will endeavor and have the desire and will choose to not sin anymore. All of these must come together for full and true repentance. Now, this is all based on God's grace and the work of the Spirit in us, regenerating us to know this, to see this, and to move beyond it. So repentance is a continual one-two of the Christian life. Yes, it is initial. We repent and believe and become a Christian. But throughout our lives, we continue to see our sin more and more, and we continue to know God more and more. So it is our call daily to repent of our sins and to walk under righteousness in God so that we can become who he has made us to be, the holy children of the living God. So repentance here has been defined. It is then qualified. If 5.2 gives us what repentance is, 5.3 is reminding us what it is not. Although repentance be not to be rested in as any satisfaction for sin or any cause of pardon thereof, which is an act of God's free grace in Christ, yet it is of such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without it. So what's going on here? Here it's going back to justification and arguing we are not justified by our repentance. We are justified by the grace of God applying the righteousness of Christ to us via imputation. Just as faith does not save unto itself, but it is the one in whom we have faith who saves us, similarly, repentance does not save us. This is specifically getting at an idea uh, put forward by the Socinians that all that is required for the salvation of the sinner is that we say we're sorry. And there need not be any satisfaction for that sin. That same idea was carried on in various ways in the 19th century, with such figures as Scottish theologian John MacLeod Campbell arguing that all we need for salvation is proper repentance, and Christ repents for us in the Garden of Gethsemane purely, and therefore our repentance is merely a repetition of that. All these ideas must be set aside. Repentance itself is not sufficient for salvation. It is required of us, but it is not sufficient for salvation or even a cause thereof. Only Christ's death and resurrection and infinite worth and power can save us. Yet, this does not mean that repentance can be abandoned. It is still necessary for sinners, but not as the cause of their salvation. Rather, we should see repentance as a necessary outworking of regeneration in faith. As we come to see who God is by the implanted faith in us, as we come to see our sin for what it is, the only natural response to it must be repentance. There can be no impenitent faith, nor can there be any repentance that isn't based on faith itself. In some ways, perhaps, we can think of repentance as the reaction of touching your hand to a hot stove. You're going to move it away. That's just what's going to happen. You're going to have a natural reaction to heat and pain, and you're going to do this. Um, it's like that. As we have faith, we will naturally repent because we will see sin for what it is. Our eyes will be opened, our hearts will be changed, and we will repent before God. But once again, this is not the basis of our salvation, but a outworking of it as we come to live. And because repentance is so glorious that God has given this gift that we can speak truthfully about our sins, not being rejected, but him saying, I know, and I know more. I know how sinful you are. And that's why Christ was sent to die for you. Because of this, repentance is so powerful. And this is something people need to hear. As there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. No sin is beyond the forgiveness of God. No sin disqualifies you utterly from the kingdom. This has to be stated firmly and fully. Repentance, which connects us to Christ's saving grace by faith, is complete. And we should call for repentance, for the biggest sin and the smallest. Even the murderer, even the adulterer, whatever sin you want to put on there, can be forgiven by the blood of Christ. And this brings a question. Some people balk at this. 
Some think this is moral laxity, but it's not. Why is it that even the murderer, even the rapist, even the child molester can be forgiven by God? Do you not in some ways recoil at that idea that God would forgive such as those? I mean, I think it's part of our natural human call for justice. But what we don't see is that because Christ's death was that powerful, he can save even the worst of sinners. And we are the worst of sinners too. No, we have not done those outward things, and some sins are worse in terms of their consequence in the world and their harm to others. Okay? There is a difference in the nature of sin, but it's in its outward consequence. But all sin deserves damnation. And if Christ could save you, as sinful as you are, and me, as sinful as I am, he could save any. And so when we call for repentance, it is complete, no matter what one sin. If you see it, if you turn to Christ, you will be saved. This is the promise, because it is based on grace and nothing in the person repenting. The chapter on repentance ends with a discussion of confession, both privately and publicly. Section 5 says that men ought not to content themselves with a general repentance, but it is every man's duty to endeavor to repent of his particular sins particularly. This is also a very helpful call here, to repent of particular sins particularly. This is a way of moving forward in our sanctification. As we see our sins and we see them clearly, we state them clearly before God, and we ask for specific forgiveness for these sins. It's very easy to go about your Christian life repenting of vague things. Lord, I repent that I was prideful today. No, when were you prideful? How were you prideful? What were the thoughts that led you there? Can you name them and therefore avoid them again? Can you see them clearly? Oh, I vaguely repent of lust in my life. Well, what exactly have you done? When were you lusting? How were you lusting? What led you to lust? How did you give in to temptation? Repent of particular sins particularly. This makes us much more attentive to the work of sin in our lives. So, so in the war with sin, we might know where we need to shore it up, where we need to put to death, and where we need to rely on the Spirit to bring us life. So in this ongoing act of repentance and confession, we need to be particular and call others to think through particularly how to repent of their sin. Now, to whom shall we repent? First and foremost, to God, because God is the one whom we have violated and sinned against. But beyond this, we must repent to those whom we have harmed, to our brothers and sisters, to those we have offended more broadly, and the church. And therefore, in 6, we see this call for repentance, not just before God, but also before others. It says, as every man is bound to make private confessions of his sin to God, praying for the pardon thereof, upon which, and the forsaking of them, he shall find mercy. So he that scandalizes his brother or the church of Christ ought to be willing by a private or public confession and sorrow for his sin to declare his repentance to those that are offended, who are thereupon to be reconciled to him and in love to receive him. Repentance and confession is one of those things that marks out the people of God as the people of God. We are not to hide our sins, but we are to repent publicly and privately to those whom we have offended. This is connected to church discipline. This is connected to removing scandal from the body of believers. We need to repent, and we need to repent to those whom we have harmed. So when we are convicted of sin, we should think through, is there somebody that I need to speak to and repent of this? Do I need to do so publicly for a public sin? And that can be done in connection with the officers of the church who think through, has the sin reached such a level that we need to publicly denounce it? In the church. And so repentance is an ongoing reality of our lives in which the Spirit of Christ makes clear the nature of our sin, the holiness of God, and our ability to turn from it by His power. And as others repent, we too need to be willing and ready to receive them, to be reconciled with them, to not hold grudges. Part of repentance is also forgiveness. And so as we receive those who have repented against us, we need to learn how to forgive. Now, forgiveness does not necessarily mean going back to a status quo. There can be temporal consequences for sin, but we should endeavor just as God has forgiven us to forgive others. And this is another part of the ongoing work of sanctification in our lives, being made holy and conformed in every way to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. 
We've covered quite a bit of ground in this lecture looking at sanctification, faith, and repentance. And I do want us to continue to think through how does it mean to live out this doctrine in every way. Doctrine is not merely for the mind, but for all aspects of one's life. And so going back to the initial discussion from Van Hooser of the different purposes of doctrine, I want to give these points of reflection. How do we celebrate in this doctrine of sanctification? Well, we rejoice in the God who is not only saves us, but sanctifies us and makes us holy by grace through faith. We celebrate not just God saving us, but him changing us, him working in us, him giving us victory over sin day and day. We rejoice and we give thanks for this sanctification. How does this doctrine help us cope with life? I think this comes up especially in the latter sections on chapter 13 and 14. It gives us a clear idea of the struggle with sin that continues to work in the believer. If we have a doctrine that says perfectionism is true, what can I conclude from my struggles with sin except that God has abandoned me or I am not truly a child of God? Having a full view of sanctification, faith, and repentance allows us to come alongside the struggling sinner, pointing them to Christ, pointing to union, and saying that this is not abnormal, that your struggle with sin does not disqualify you from the kingdom of God. But you are beloved. Struggle, fight, put to death your sin, and live unto righteousness. You have the power. You have the blessing of the Spirit to do so. And so in our walk with others and with our own internal walk, the doctrine of sanctification, faith, and repentance helps us to cope with the actual reality that we experience in this world. Additionally, it helps us communicate clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ. The relationship of justification and sanctification is paramount. Unless we properly distinguish what makes us righteous before God, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, and how we are continually made holy, the infused grace of the Holy Spirit, we will easily fall into either legalism or antinomianism, and this is no way appropriate. So as we think through how to preach the gospel, how to guide others in the faith, we need to remember this distinction and use it appropriately. Additionally, we have the process of criticism. Remember, true doctrine is a rejection of false doctrine. And so by understanding sanctification, faith, and repentance, we avoid the twin errors of rejecting the law and making a new law. From beginning to end, we trust in the grace of Christ alone by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then ultimately continuing, what does it mean to enact this in our own lives? How do we work to trust in the saving work of Christ, to know him, to trust in him, to have conviction of his power, to trust in his spirit, to die unto sin, and to live unto righteousness day upon day, to have a life of faith, receiving and resting on Christ alone for our justification, repenting to him, confessing our sins, and being made new in his life. This is the hope of the Christian life, to live out our faith in Christ by continual repentance, knowing that he is holy and righteous and good, and he will produce his work in us by the Spirit unto the glory of the Father. We'll be moving on to other means of sanctification and aids in the Christian life in following lectures on assurance, preservation, and the law of God.